This is a real honor to be here today, and I thank you for this. I came of age in the 1960s, a very turbulent decade. Civil rights movement, the assassinations of John and Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., the Beatles, the Vietnam War, Woodstock, the Nixon presidency, and a man on the moon. During that time, guys like me made commitments, and mine was that if I ever had the opportunity, I wanted to help others. As you heard, most of my professional career was as chief human resources guy for Steve Wynn. I opened and helped operate all of his casinos in Las Vegas, Atlantic City, Mississippi, and China. And during that time, the recruitment programs that I managed attracted over three million applications. And from them, I hired 125,000 great employees. To say that I was flush with applications would be an understatement. But to think that I ever stopped looking for others would be a mistake. Here then are some stories of a few alternate recruitment strategies that I initiated and some lessons that I learned. 1989, we opened the Mirage. We had 55,000 applications for 5,000 jobs. In the year after we opened, we had high morale, low turnover. Everybody wanted to work for us. And one day I get a call from Steve Wynn's office and he says, come on down, I want you to meet somebody. So I hustle down there and while I'm going, I'm thinking, geez, this guy, Steve Wynn, he is the best recruitment magnet that any HR guy could ever hope for. And I go in and he's talking to Frank, who is a Las Vegas city councilman. And Frank is saying uh, he has a constituent that he'd like us to consider hiring. And I'm thinking, boy, this is great. Good referral. And he said, now, uh, don't judge a book by its cover. What? He said, uh, this guy was in a gang. <laughs> and uh, he, he went to jail for a few years. <laughs> a few years. And... Um, but he's out now, and his girlfriend's pregnant, and they're going to have a baby. <laughs> and, um, you know, he wants to go straight, and he wants to raise the kid normally. Well, bring him in, I say. So he goes out, and he brings in this guy. In the doorway is Tony, who's six feet three, shaved head, buff, probably from working out on the yard, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> and, and one eye. And no eye patch. Okay, so we're, we're talking for a little while, and finally he looks at me and he goes, you want to know, don't you? What? He goes, knife fight. <laughs> and I won. Oh, congratulations. Well, that broke the ice. I mean, we started talking, you know, in depth after that. But I have to tell you, after about 15 minutes, he made a good impression. And I looked at Steve and I said, hey, if you're up for this, I've got some ideas here. And I remember Steve looking at me going, <laughs> oh, okay, okay, so I take Tony to meet Joe, who's the public area manager, the people that, that do all the heavy cleaning in the hotels. And I go in and I say, Joe, Steve and I just interviewed this guy, and uh, we think he'd be okay in your department. And uh, okay, so he said, bring him in. So I go and I get Tony, and we come in, and Joe's working on his desk. And I say, uh, Joe, this is Tony. And, and Joe looks up and he goes, ah, Jesus, what is with that eye? God, I said, wait, wait, hold it. Don't judge a book by its cover, please. He goes, okay. So we talk for another 15 minutes and, and again, Tony impresses us. And Joe goes, well, yeah, may, maybe we can put him to work. Maybe Graveyard, you know, the, the manager there. Um, <laughs> that's the shift, okay. The, uh, the, the manager there is good at working with guys like this. So that night, I take Tony to the pre-shift meeting to meet everybody. And I go in, I say, ladies and gentlemen, I'd, I'd, uh, Joe and I interviewed this guy this afternoon. We think uh, he'd be okay on your team. Let me bring him in. So I go and I bring Tony in. And there's 19 men and women in this room for their pre-shift meeting. And in unison, they all go, ah, Jesus, what is with that? And they're all like huddled over here. I said, well, hold, wait, wait, don't judge a book by its cover, please. And we talk for a while and he impresses them. They say, well, come on, let's go to work. So the next morning, he starts work. Three months later, I'm keeping an eye on the guy. No, no, no pun intended, really, okay. And uh, he passes probation. 
And I go to congratulate him, and I say, Tony, congratulations. And he says, thank you very much, Mr. Nathan. And I'm noticing he has an eye patch. And three months later, he gets promoted to lead. And one year later, he's a supervisor. And here we are nearly 25 years later. He's a manager there. And that kid that he had all those years ago just graduated from college. You see, you really can't judge a book by its cover. You just don't know. Well, then it's 1994. We're opening Treasure Island. 65,000 applications, another 5,000 jobs. I'm at a Chamber of Commerce meeting. And I'm sitting next to Howard, who is the director of the Department of Corrections in Nevada. And he turns to me and goes, I got something I got to show you. So after the meeting, we go for a ride up to Indian Springs, where the main prison is in southern Nevada. And we drive around the big prison, and next to it is this little enclave. And he says, this is the boot camp. It is a new facility where the judges and the district attorneys can decide to send some first-time nonviolent felony offenders if they think this will help rehabilitate them. Hmm. Come on, I want you to meet the commandant. commandant. So we go in, and he introduces me to Pete. Pete is an ex-Marine drill sergeant who looks just like what an ex-Marine drill sergeant would look like if you ordered him from central casting. Big guy, crew cut, booming voice. He goes, what we have here is a new facility where we will take young men and we will rehabilitate them through hard work and calisthenics and coaching and counseling. And what we then need, and this is where you come in, my boy, what we need is someone to give them a second chance. Okay, so he says, come on with me, and we go to the front gate, and at the front gate, the bus pulls up, and five guys get out with their, their little duffel bags, and they come through the front gate, and Pete goes, drop your duffel bags, and they drop their duffel bags, he goes, get in the pit. Now, the pit is what looks like an oversized uh, sandbox, full of sand, obviously, but in this case, it's saturated with water, so that's mud. And he goes, get in the sandbox, and they get in the box. He goes, start doing cal and they're doing jumping jacks, and they do deep knee bends, and then squat thrusts, and then more jumping jacks, and then sit-ups, and push-ups, and running in place. And he turns to me, and he goes, these young men will leave their attitudes in the mud. <laughs> okay. He said, now I want you to come back often and watch their progress. And I do. I go back every couple weeks, and after six months, I go to the first graduation. And I meet Jose. And Jose is like this. The only thing he doesn't do is salute me. It's like this. He goes, Mr. Nathan, I want to thank you for considering me for a second chance. And if you give it to me, I promise I won't let you down. I won't let my comrades down here, and I won't let society down. What do you say? He's, well, okay, I hire him as a landscaper. Put him to work as a laborer. Six months later, he's working in the tool room. A year later, he's a supervisor. And here we are 19 years later, he and his wife and three children, all of whom are straight-A students in high school, are living in North Las Vegas. Sometimes a second chance works. And then we open up Bellagio, 85,000 applications, 9,000 jobs. I'm again at a Chamber of Commerce meeting, and I'm sitting next to John, who is the franchisee for the local Burger Kings. And he is lamenting the fact that oh, I, I've got 300% turnover. Uh, these, these people, they come and go, and I, I can't get any traction. There's no consistency. I can't get good customer service. How do you, how do, you do deal with something like this, Artie? I say, well, look, in our company, we provide people with opportunities. And those opportunities motivate them to, to stay and to work hard and to get promoted. He goes, I, I don't know how I do anything like that. I say, I'll tell you what, John. If you have an employee, any employees that stay six months in your company, I'll make them a job offer at Bellagio to work in our kitchens for one of our celebrity chefs. He says, you do that for me? I'm thinking six months, 300% turnover, nobody's going to be there, but what the heck? <laughs> I said, sure I will. Six months later, he calls me up. He says, I I'd like to introduce you to Darnell. Who? Darnell. Well, who's Darnell? He, look, this young man heard about your offer, 
And he's been here six months. He's been working very hard. He's missed only one day of work, and he'd like to meet you. Come on over for lunch. Okay, so I go get a Whopper, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and there's Darnell. He takes my hand and both of his, and he says, Mr. Nathan, this opportunity that you're offering us means so much to me, and if you would allow me, I would love to work for your company, and I won't let you down. Well, what do you say? Well, okay, I'll put you to work. Come on, you'll go to work in the kitchens. Now, he goes to work in the kitchen as a prep cook. This is one of those guys that's gone from cocaine to cooking, and he is doing wonderfully. Today, 15 years later, he's an executive chef, all because somebody gave him an opportunity. Hmm. And then I went back and I opened the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas. 125,000 applications for 10,000 jobs. One day I'm in my office and one of my Staff comes to get me, and she says, Artie, come here. There's somebody I want you to meet and give me a hand with. Okay, so I go out. She goes, Artie, I'd like you to meet Derek. And I say, hi, Derek, how are you? And Derek looks at me and goes, hello, Mr. Nathan. I really want to work for Steve Wynn. Now, it's obvious to me that Derek has profound disabilities. He said, my parents brought me here today for my interview. I said, your parents are here? Yes, they are. They're back there. So I said, excuse me. So I go meet his parents. And the mother and father say to me, Derek is a part-time assistant dishwasher in an off-strip restaurant. For the past year, he has paid attention to the news, and he has watched the building of Steve Wynn's new hotel. And all he's talked about is having a chance to be a dishwasher at Steve Wynn's hotel. And he went online with us, and we helped him fill out his application. He got an appointment, we're here today, and I hope you'll consider him. Hmm. So I go back and I say, Derek, tell me what you want to do. And he says, Mr. Nathan, I only want to work for Steve Wynn. I want to be the best dishwasher that the Wynn Hotel ever hired. I said, you really want to do that, Derek? He said, yes, sir, I do. I said, I'll tell you what, Derek, you've got the job. Well, the kid goes, and he jumps up and he gives me the biggest hug, and I'm looking over his shoulder, and I see his parents crying. And I look down, and the woman who had come to get me was crying. And I look around the office, and everybody's crying. <laughs> and it dawns on me that sometimes a good deed is its own reward. Those are some of the crazy things I got involved with hiring all these people. And people often assume that I went looking for more applications because I needed them, which was not the case. I, I did all these programs because they were the right things to do. And they helped me keep that promise that I made so many years ago to help others. And along the way, I learned that you can't judge a book by its cover, that Giving people a second chance and an opportunity can change lives. And that good deeds really are their own rewards. But maybe the most important thing I learned was that sometimes just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. But then there are other times that because you can, you absolutely should. Thank you.